Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Paul Adipoju from the International Center for Journalists, and I'm really, really excited that we are at this uh, really, really critical uh, point in the series that we've been um, undertaking since the first week in July, which is on how to really, really report on semantics. We've had uh, scientists, uh, we've had math reporters, we've also had uh, math innovators coming around to share insights. And I'm really, really glad that today uh, we'll be uh, interacting directly with uh, two amazing uh, mathematics researchers. And um, I'm really excited about this. And uh, what are we trying to do today? Uh, today, we are hoping everything we've learned um, in the past uh, three weeks, uh, we'll be able to apply it. Or if you're still struggling with applying some of these insights, You'll be able to see how conversations with scientists really, really work, how to get them to really, really simplify their work in languages that you can understand and relate with, and to also understand what they are excited about. I remember the fourth, the second, during okay, during last week's session, uh, one a key message we had was that uh, you cannot know mathematics more than the mathematician. So the best you are at effectively communicating with them uh, the more the higher your chance of being able to really understand what is happening in the industry and uh, to have guidance on where you should talk, turn your attention to and i'm really excited that you are joining us in different parts of the world as some of our you are already doing uh please do engage with us in the chat box uh, let us know your name and where you are joining us from and um, we are really hoping that at the end of the day uh, we'll be able to interact as extensively as possible i have a science background so i'm really really always excited talking about science i'm always really <laughs> excited because uh, mathematics until recently until we started this series for many of you that you've actually given me your feedback uh, used to be a no-go area and it's no is really not a surprise that we really really have very few mathematics reporters. But as some of you have already indicated, um, taking your uh, planning to take this series forward and start talking about mathematics and uh, to really, really encourage you in your journey, we will, at the end of this session, be officially commencing, kicking off our mathematics story grant competition. So um, from today, you can send your ideas and uh, we'll we are going to uh, announce the person that is going to be going away with the cash prize uh, for the story grant. And hopefully we, I hope, ideally that uh, the conversation I'll be having with our scientists today uh, could actually be something that you would like to work on. So many, many thanks uh, from different parts of the world. We have Gezu from Ethiopia, Florence from Nigeria, Haren, Philadelphia. Glory Dane is joining us from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Francis is in Cameroon, Nabubaka. Thank you. So we have people from all over the world. Talking from people from different parts of the world, I'm happy and excited to introduce our, our panelists today. I am uh, excited about, uh, damn, I should have asked how to pronounce your name before we started. So I will play it safe and introduce Alexandria. <laughs> from Purdue University. How are you doing today, Alexander? And thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And I also like to introduce Hian Griffith, uh, who is also from who is also joining us today uh, from the University of Oxford. Thanks, Proven. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Yes, before we start our panel discussion, I also want to say a quick shout out to those that are watching this video live, live stream on Facebook. Uh, we know in some parts of the world, uh, accessing Zoom is really, really difficult. And a lot of our audience also watch this live stream on Facebook. So thank you. Thank you jo for joining us and also interact with us in the, in the comment box below this video that you are watching. And I would like to start our conversation, I think uh, one of the things that really, really intrigued me uh, about uh, Alexandria was the fact that I read uh, one of the articles um, in a journal that is actually targeted for children. I So the first question I have on my mind was that if I have you on this panel, this is a question I will have on your mind for you. What came, how did you decide uh, to publish uh, your journal? in a, your article uh, in a journal targeted at children. And how was that experience for you in terms of simplifying and communicating uh, mathematics? Sure, Paul. Thanks for that question. So that was, uh, the journal is called Frontiers for Young Minds. And it's 
I think a great place to find math that's uh, accessible. There's other uh, publications there that have been written by mathematicians for child audiences. For me, I did not, so I, I work on mathematical biology. That's an uh, area where you use biology to raise new mathematical questions or you use math to make an impact on biological questions. And I didn't even know that mathematical biology existed until I was halfway through college. And that's really what excited me about math. So writing that article for children grew out of an outreach project that I developed where I would lead crafts in uh, elementary schools. And it's really this place where I want to introduce children earlier on to the idea that math is broader than what they think, and also put them in a place where they can see themselves as mathematicians and put in that role themselves. That that paper was really something that was very close to my heart and, and special to me to be able to write that and share the enthusiasm and, and try and communicate that to, to a younger audience. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Then I'll bring you to here and how you're in the University of Oxford. And um, I know um, your first paper that I personally saw had to do with um, COVID-19 uh, research. And for me and uh, for several other journalists, uh, when we think about COVID-19 reporting, uh, very few actually have my math had a, a, a jumping at them right away that this is uh, this is the problem that we can address uh, through mathematics. So I would like to understand um, your your process regarding um, convincing uh, those that care to listen or that you care to talk about that these different issues, I know it's not just health issues that you are working on. I've also seen the works on there several other issues that are non-health. So I, what is the process of convincing people that these array of problems also have math elements? Yes, I think it's a difficult process of convincing people. I think we lie quite far away from um, people who would implement this work um, eventually. So in the case of the COVID-19 work, we were contacted by the Welsh government. And we worked in collaboration with the Welsh government to try to understand how we could um, reopen indoor spaces. And then we had various communication lines from the Welsh government. And actually I'll, I'll talk a little about these in a presentation that you've asked me to, to make about how we made that communication from the mathematics to the people who need it. Because I think it's difficult. It's not an easy challenge, um, but it's something that is important to do. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And before we take that presentation, I just want us to lay the groundwork and um, building uh, gradually uh, easing into it. So for you, uh, for you, uh, Alexandra, uh, if we want to talk about um, the major uh, dilemma in mathematics ecosystem, the major issues, the frontiers, uh, when you pick every time you uh, you wake up or you are, you are talking about math and um, what kind of issues do you think uh, ought to be properly communicated that you think is not done or is being done wrongly? Can you take that or should we, we like to think about it so that we come back to that question after Kian's presentation? Do you want to take, start it? Oh, I, I mean, that's, that's a question, that's a, that's a big question. I think from a research perspective, we are all like niche experts in our own area. So it would be hard to comment on, you know, the big questions in mathematical biology would be heavily focused on the types of things that I study in math biology. So I think big questions that I'm generally interested in are how cells organize during organism development to create tissue and shape. So we can all look in the mirror and see, for example, that our face is symmetric on either side. And that's really a mathematical problem of how do all these cells know how to organize themselves in a symmetric way. How can we uh, understand that using mathematics? I think those types of questions are the questions that I'm interested in. Uh, but more generally, I'm just really excited to be interacting with journalists. I think that this is an opportunity for, it goes both ways, right? I think mathematicians need to learn how to present their work more accessibly and more engaging. Uh, and I, I really think there's an opportunity for training math students throughout to be 
taking the research and presenting it in an accessible way and working with journalists in order to write it and follow along research papers with those presentations or to give it to a different audience. So I think that that is a, a bigger question, just how do we communicate math? How do we communicate its usefulness? Uh, and how do we train students to do that? Because that will make them more effective scientists throughout. Because even within our niche math areas, right, we, we may not understand each other, but being able to communicate would help that. Absolutely. So thank you very much, Hen. Um, we are ready. You have the capability to share screen if I'm absolutely correct. So while we do that, uh, thank you to those that are in the audience and you have the ability to actually uh, ask questions. And um, so if you would like to ask any question, uh, you can use um, the Q and A tool on the Zoom platform, or you can use, you can raise your hand and not to actually try your luck on being able to actually talk directly uh, with this. But as far as I'm concerned, I can have this conversation for two hours. So <laughs> talking about, so are you ready here? Yeah? I am ready, yes. I will share something with you. And uh, I'm not sure how you want to work with the questions. Maybe they'll pop up and I'll see them. But if I don't, then please yell out as please. we- uh, OK, uh, don't bother about the questions. Don't worry, I'll coordinate and uh, just- OK, I'll coordinate OK. I'll, uh, yeah. Okay, so hopefully you should be able to see uh, my screen now. And it's not on full uh, screen yet. Full screen. Yeah, it's not on full screen now. Um, so I'm going to do two things during this talk. One is show a video, and two is show a website. So it might involve a bit of jumping around, and I might rely on you to tell me if you can see everything as well. But we'll do that as we work our way through. And this is just about a 20 minute presentation. That's what Paul asked me to prepare here. And it's my thoughts on the question that we are asking here in how can mathematics help with responses to global crises? And also how we should be communicating. It's exactly as Alexandria just said, how should we as mathematicians be communicating with journalists and vice versa to make sure that we're all doing the best that we can. And to illustrate this, I have used two case studies, which I'll now talk through. So the first case study is on water purification. And here, this work started a number of years ago now, when we came across this uh, research that was done um, about 20 years ago or so now. And this was when UNICEF launched an initiative to provide clean, safe water for residents in Bangladesh. And the idea was that they would drill boreholes into the ground so that the Bangladeshis could drink the clean water in the ground rather than the contaminated surface water. So this was a great idea in principle, but in practice, it turned out to be a disaster because the groundwater is naturally tainted with arsenic. And this turned out to be what's been described as the largest global mass poisoning and has killed many millions of people. And so we came across this and tried to come up with a way in which we could help this problem of arsenic removal from the water. And it turns out that it can come in quite a simple way. And that is through this laterite soil. Now, laterite soil is readily available in Bangladesh and in India, and it is iron rich soil. And you can see that in the picture on the right hand side here because it's quite red and that's showing that there's a lot of iron in the soil. And the good thing about iron is that it binds to arsenic. And so what we can do is we can take a setup like we have in this picture on the left. Hopefully you can see my mouse. We fill the top here, this dustbin full of contaminated arsenic water. And this cylinder here is full of this laterite soil. And the contaminated water passes through this soil and the soil absorbs the arsenic so that what you get out of the bottom that trickles out into this container at the bottom is pure water. It contains no arsenic whatsoever. So this is a, a great filter, and these filters have found their way into family homes in India and in Bangladesh, and they look exactly like this. So my postdoc has one of these filters in her family home in India. But the questions that we worked on here were, how do we know when a filter has expired? Some of you might have Brita water filters in your family homes, and you have to replace these every couple of months. 
But if you don't replace them, it's not the end of the world. It just means that your water isn't as pure as you would like it to be. Here, if you don't replace this filter, then you're drinking contaminated water with arsenic, and that could kill you. And the second question that we wanted to address is how we upscale this for a school or community. So we need an order of magnitude larger flow rate of water. So those were the questions that we wanted to tackle. And now what I'm going to show you is a video and hopefully you can hear the audio. If you can just yell out if you don't hear the audio well. I, I don't think, I think sometimes there's a way I can share my audio. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Okay, I'll play the video and please just yell out if you don't hear it well. What we're trying to do really is develop mathematical models that can help purify water all over the world. Arsenic contamination and other contaminants, it's been described as the largest global mass poisoning. It's affected more than 3 million people. Using a very simple, readily available laterite soil, which is, which is this stuff here. Because it's readily available, that makes it very cheap. And then you take the contaminated water, and then it passes through this column of laterite soil, which is about a, a metre or so high. And what you get out of the bottom is almost pure water. If you run this filter for a long time, eventually the, the filter cannot soak up any more arsenic. It's a, um, become saturated. And so the key question that we're trying to address is how long before we need to replace this film? You cannot run an experiment for six or seven years to work out how long this, this filter would last. So we need to have accelerated tests and, and running them on a computer gives you that, that test. What we wanted to do with our mathematical modeling is take something that is a very complicated problem and reduce it down to something very simple. But what you want to know ultimately is what is the concentration of arsenic in the water that comes out? That's all you really want to know. Ideally, we wanted to be able to explain the whole problem in terms of a single parameter. So this number uh, relates to how much mass of soil you're using and the required flow rate and the absorption capacity of the, of the soil itself. The typical uh, exchange rate at the moment is about five or six years. Our predictions say they can last to maybe seven or eight years. So it gives you a little bit of extra time for these filters. The key point of our models is that now if you want to make a, another filter for a particular size school or something, then anybody who comes in and says they want to filter with a particular flow rate, we just give them the number and say this is this is how you would make that filter. So we're, we're trying to make something that that alleviates some of the complications in the, in the problem. For me, innovation is very important. I'm a very applied mathematician, and that means that I interact with a lot of different industries. And that's a good way to find out exactly what the key questions are. I think as, as mathematicians, we can get a bit caught up on some of the fine details that we find interesting that might not necessarily be the key questions. So, working with industries, working with experimentalists and the wider scientific community is a good way to, to keep us grounded and make sure that we are innovating. So I wanted to show you that and, and indeed the rest of this talk as well to try and give you an idea of how we are trying to communicate our work in a journalism style and we'll talk a bit more as the talk evolves but that was why I showed you that video. The state of deployment of these now, we have 150,000 um, uh, people served by these filters and they're manufactured by two companies and UNICEF have now deployed 45 community scale filters. And we're now at the stage where we're looking into the removal of fluoride and reactive dye. And reactive dye is the, the material that is used to color your clothing. And this is often pumped out into wastewater streams. So here in the pictures, we have a, a school filter on the left hand side, these are my collaborators, and in the right hand side, we have a community scale filter. And so here I'm just going to point out some things that I think are the mathematicians responses here. And um, so thoughts that I have are that videos and we did case studies as well in this case can often give a broader reach to the public trying to communicate this. In this case, we interacted with chemical engineers who acted as technology translators, helping us as mathematicians who are kind of the, the lowest rung in terms of how we communicate. 
Um, some of the challenges we faced in this case was international engagement with a developing country. And we found that there were different timescales for the experiments and the theory of this study. Sometimes the experiments were taking longer than, than we wanted them to do. And sometimes we were slower with the development of the mathematics than the experimentalists wanted us to be. So these are some of the challenges that we encountered with this project. So the next um, case study of two that I wanted to present was the one that Paul already mentioned. And this was about COVID transmission. Now, as I said earlier, when Paul asked me about this, we were approached by the Welsh government with this deep in the pandemic with the question of, can I eat dinner with my friends? This was when we were starting to reopen indoor spaces, but weren't sure which ones we could open. Is school safe? And is the gym safe? And these were the kinds of questions that the Welsh government wanted us to tackle. And the reason that we were asked to tackle this was because, as you know, the air and virus flow in a room is very complicated, as illustrated by this picture here from the University of Oregon. You can see air flows illustrated in these blue swirls, and you can see dots which represent the viral particles being transmitted around. Now, if we wanted to try to understand the risk of catching a virus in this room, you can see immediately it's not an easy question. Now, the one way in which this was approached from a mathematical perspective was to assume that the virus is spread uniformly in a room. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the mathematics here, but not much. And so this means that the chance of catching the virus in one side of the room is the same as in the other. Now, we know that's not true because there may be a person who is contagious in one side of the room. But this is a good way to get a fast prediction of whether you are likely to catch the virus in an indoor space. However, what we saw from some of the early data was that the chance of catching the virus was very dependent on space. Here's the super spreader incident very early on in the pandemic. And the yellow circled person here, A1, was contagious. And all the people who were circled red here ended up catching the virus. And all the people that are not circled red did not. So you can see that those on table E and F were perfectly safe. So you can see there is dependence on where you sit. And here specifically, you can tell that there's something to do with the air conditioner on the right hand side, blowing the air and recirculating it round. So we decided to do something that was in between the two ideas that I've shown you. The first one with the very complicated airflow that takes a long time to understand mathematically. And the second one where we just say the chance of catching the virus is the same anywhere in a room. So to do this, we modeled the airflow as a loop pattern as shown here. You can see that this is generated by an air conditioning unit. And on top of this, we then developed this um, web app, which I'm going to now show you online. So you can have a look yourself on this bit.ly link here, but I'll just stop sharing this and then I will share my, um, my uh, website here. So here is our website. Um, what we have here is some information about the, the viral transmission um, uh, model. So we have something about the ventilation. This is the air conditioner. We have the duration of the event. So maybe it's, I don't know, uh, one hour long that we're in this room for. And then here we've got the room. So I can change dynamically the shape of the room, which is down here. And I can move the people around. So we've got this person here that has a virus. You can see the red virus around. You can have a person here at the moment got no mask on, but well, let's put them a mask on them. So I'll scroll down here. I'll put a three ply cloth mask on. So now we see that they're covered with a mask and we can move them around. And once you're happy with this, you now want to say if I'm here and the virus person is here in this room of this size, what is the chance of catching the virus? So at this point, you hit run here, and you can see it takes a little uh, while, but it's nothing compared with complicated computational simulations, which take days. So when this is run, you can see it gives you a chance of catching the virus if you're one hour in this room. So this is giving you a 20% chance of catching the virus. 
And then further on, you get more information here, should you wish. But what we thought, let me go back to my presentation again now, is that this was a nice way to share our, our um, work in a way that is perhaps more understandable to the public and lends itself more to a journalism style. So once we'd done this, just to finish up on this, we connected with a company called Smart Separations who had invented an air purifier that removes coronavirus from the air. The little tabletop air purifier called Gino, which you can see here, this little black device here. And here we were trying to figure out how Gino might be able to help in opening indoor spaces if we were to place lots of these in a school, for instance. So here we've got two people talking to one another. The person on the left has coronavirus and they're speaking and you can see the airflow going straight into the face of the person on the right. Now, if we switch on the Gino, which is in the middle of the room, the airflow is sucked in and what you get blown out now is purified air. So we were able to quantify how Gino captures the coronavirus air. So here, the mathematician's response, I think, we were feeling that sometimes academic journals may not always be our friends. Sometimes we can communicate our work in different ways with the academic journal as a support. And we've been playing around with these ideas, sometimes unsuccessfully, sometimes successfully. We closely collaborate with industries and that allows us to fine tune and make sure that the mathematics that we're doing here is meaningful. So a question for us today is, are web apps and these interactive journals a better way of communicating our work? Are they something that complements journals? And I don't know the answer. As I say, it's something that I'm playing around with, sometimes unsuccessfully. So finally, I just wanted to talk about some knowledge exchange that we do here in Oxford that speaks to journalists. We have a public engagement team here that's dedicated to Oxford which uses social media. We have 70,000 maths Twitter followers, 368,000 maths YouTube subscribers, and we also have university social media. And one of the interesting things, having spoken with this public engagement team that they say is, we don't know who the audience is. We may be speaking to mathematicians, we may be speaking with eight-year-old children or anything in between. And that makes it quite an interesting challenge to communicate, and I'm sure it's one that as journalists you face every day. We also do public lectures. I've done one of these myself. Uh, case studies, I've done several of these. Videos, I've shown you a video for the arsenic removal and newsletters as well. And so to finish, some closing thoughts here. I think that mathematicians provide an important contribution to tackling global challenges at the fundamental level. But I think sometimes that means that it can be quite hard to make that gap to communicating with the general public. So as a result, often the work is not taken up due to a lack of communication. So I think we need to interact with publicity makers in a, in a key way. And that's through videos, press articles, interviews with journalists, case studies, web apps and social media. And I think finally, I'd just like to say that we all should be willing to try different approaches, even as in the case for me, many times they sometimes fail. And so with that, I will stop. But hopefully that's given a flavour from my side of communicating mathematics uh, to the wider public. So I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I think uh, that was really, really spot on. Uh, that was really, really um, the kind of message that we expect to help us communicate. And you've done that brilliantly. I would, before I uh, give you the questions that we already have, I uh, will give uh, Alexandria an opportunity uh, to respond, to comment, and share thoughts on what he and just shared. Oh, I thought that was a wonderful presentation, Ian. And very cool. I saw on the the one thing that stuck out to me was the web app where you say like a 20% chance of getting the virus. I do some uh, election forecasting and also create websites for that. And I think it's hard to communicate like probability and communicate chances, right? Especially when there's a risk. Did you, did you think in particular about how to communicate 
what that chance meant. Yes, we thought about this so much and we had so many conversations, both among the mathematicians involved and also with the, the Welsh government. And I don't think we, we came to a consensus and, and probably you found, you found the same with your kind of work is it's very hard to communicate this, this notion of a probability because what does it mean to have a 20% chance of catching the virus? Um, and I, I don't know what the answer is. And, and I think that that kind of, is 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 some of the points that I made about sometimes things failing is that we put all of this effort in and then it fails at this point of I don't understand what a probability means um so I don't know and, and these are the kinds of conversations I really enjoy having is that can we communicate at a better level and the only thing I found really is, is having something much simpler is better getting some message across is better than trying to get a lot across yeah but it's a really good question you you get you get the the issues. Thank you so much. So I uh, as another this one to take a shot. <laughs> you want to go back to it. So the question we have is I think you started, which is uh, um, somebody uh, we've had uh, we've had sessions and uh, it's all when they talk about the mathematics element is always about risk prediction. Now for a journalist, it's when you publish. He, as a as a scientist, you are able to pack in all the caveats, all the limitations, all the warnings regarding what you are what you are putting in a science journal. But for a journalist that is trying to communicate, that is trying to report on these stories, you don't have those uh, those uh, wide large amount of words. Remember, if you, the large amount of words to be able to pack that in and easily communicate. For sometimes you see uh, a report, probably you publish a story that is communicating that there is a probability of this happening. But by the time it goes into press in a news article, it becomes a, a largely affirmative that this is actually going to happen. So when that doesn't happen, people, uh, the blame goes back to the scientist. So what are your thoughts on communicating the limitations of mathematical prediction? Alexandra, you start. Oh, <laughs> um, I mean, I just agree. I think that that is really, really difficult. Um, in So when I work with journalists on work, it's really important for, for them to send it I, I always ask them to see the, the material afterward or if they reach out to me first and they say, we'll send you a draft first, that makes me feel more at ease uh, and, and more likely to participate because yeah, it's it's very true. And I think that, um, yeah, I just think that, that, I think I agree, Paul. I think that's something to be very careful about. Um, yeah. Ian? Yes, I, I would say exactly the same. There have been times when I've been burnt by somebody taking what I have, have said or written and not sharing it back with me. And then suddenly there are, from slight changes, it's suddenly a completely different story. But I think with a bit of to and fro, you can often get to some happy medium. And, and you always have to acknowledge that you're not going to be able to get all of the information and all of the caveats in, but a two-way exchange is so important. And it's also respectful from both sides then, I think. I think it's bad if someone just takes and then, then communicates it in their own way. Now, the reason that is, okay, from a journalist perspective, now I'm the journalist, I the advocate, and I think I'm the intermediary. The reason why that happens is um, if I'm working with, for a story with a news outlet, that news like let's often have this caveat that we don't show the person you've interviewed the final copy uh, to protect a uh, journalist uh, report independence. But we've been having a, a solution. I think a mid a mid-team point, a midpoint that seems to exist is sharing your quotes. Uh, the aspects that you are going to be cited in verbatim and probably going over and over and over again regarding the explanation that you are going to give, uh, you are giving. How can you overcome that? And is that good enough for you? Anybody? Alexander and Ian, what are your thoughts on that? Consensus. Can we agree that that works? Who do you want to go first? 
You want to go, Alexandria? Um, go ahead, Ian. Um, I think it's it's still very difficult. If there is no return, um, you can often take things verbatim and switch them around a little bit, and then the message is quite different. So I think you have to be incredibly careful there, especially because often what happens is you say something to the journalist, the journalist publishes it, then somebody gets back and says, this is false. And then the journalist steps back and says, not my problem. And I think that's when it gets tricky because then the person who said it has to um, defend something that perhaps they, they didn't say in that way. And I think that is when you have to be very careful. Although I do appreciate that there are some times when journalists need to be protective about what they've written so that it doesn't get out to, to others. I think it's a delicate balance there. Yes, but before my next question, Alexandra, any other additional personal thoughts on this? So, uh, it, was, it was just very interesting to hear that. I think from, from the, the, the academic publication perspective too, these are usually, there's embargoes on whether or not you can send your publication out to journalists ahead of time for them to write up a kind of coverage on it. So I think that it goes both ways that these the kind of blanket hidden, it, it's hard. I mean, maybe the best way to go about this if you had to keep the article hidden would be at least to ask for feedback from the mathematician on what are the important points that it's very you know clear to stress is, is it okay to say is it where where do they want there to be less confidence or more confidence in the language yeah that's Absolutely. really nice i like i like that idea yeah thank you so much so the next question that we have has to do with uh, interrogating a mathematical formula uh you uh that was asked when he and was talking about um the formula developed uh, for the future a science, a journalist that thinks uh, the best, uh, the far furthest that a sign, a journalist may go with that story is to just talk about the future and ignore the science process behind it, the formula that used to predict. And I think every journalist will actually, most journalists would do that and just leave the complex issue for you. But I believe the juice in the is in the formula. So how can a journalist, how can you simplify that so that I can understand it and be able to write a unique story and just say um, the the equation behind the future saving lives in India, you know, that part. That is a different approach than just, you just saying uh, this future has been released and is helping to improve life. So how can you help us simplify that formula? And let's give it a try. I wanted to attempt to do that here. <laughs> you want me to answer this? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> It was a question that we were very mindful of when working on this filter problem. So in the video, you um, may have seen that there were quite complicated equations flying around in the cartoon in the background. And then when I started speaking, I said we wanted to distill this into something quite simple. And then I talked about a very simple equation that just had a few symbols in. So we were mindful of the fact that if we gave complicated equations to a journalist, then they, they wouldn't do anything with them. But if we give a simple equation that says, if you change this, then this goes up, then that's something that is easier to put into a journalistic framework. So I think we, we made that step in that case. I think it's when you have a mathematical theory that is very complicated and you don't do anything to explain it. That would be my answer. So Alexandra, uh, what are your thoughts on simplifying um, complex concepts? Because we believe, I believe, those complex concepts are where unique and insightful stories are carefully hidden. So I, I think that, um, so I think in most articles, you don't need to see the equations. I think that the way Ian was talking about how in some mathematical models, people were just assuming that that the disease spreads all over the place uniformly and just think of like heat spreading in a room versus a model where you describe the behavior of every single particle of coronavirus in space as those being simple and complex models and his description being somewhere in the middle where you account for airflow. So saying what the equation says without actually showing the equation, I think is how we would talk about it in a, a research presentation anyway. We would just show the terms in the equations and say what each one of those means. 
Yes, thank you so much. So we have another question that uh, regarding um, the COVID solution that uh, that you mentioned here, and uh, whether it works in all settings or is it restricted to a particular part of the world? And um, an, an additional question: um, How can a journalist report on its uh, effectiveness and uh, probably highlight uh, the limitations of that potential solution? The first question, what settings does it work in? Well, really it works in settings where you have this air flow in a loop, such as that generated by an air conditioning unit. If you're in a setup where you have perhaps multiple fans in the room that are blowing in all different directions, or perhaps you don't have any fans at all, then it doesn't work in those settings. So we had to make some simplifications, but recognize that in many of the situations we were interested in, such as a restaurant or a gym, you often had this air recirculation taking place. So that's the context of uh, when it works and when it doesn't. And then in terms of publishing, can you just remind me what specifically you were interested in about the, the journalism part again? Okay, I think, okay, the, the expansion for the question now is, um, there are, there are several other solutions like uh, that were said to be actually killing bacteria, uh, coronavirus. And uh, if we want to, if a journalist wants to report on probably whether these solutions are effective or not, uh, are there basic mathematical insights or what is glaring that somebody can, a journalist can actually consider and say, okay, putting these two and two together may actually provide an insight whether the solution is working or not. I think, uh, you know, if during the heat of the COVID pandemic, we had lots of solutions premium up, people claiming that uh, if you put this on your, if you put this badge on you, it's going to kill the virus. So uh, from a mathematical angle, what is the advice for journalists that want to talk about those kinds of solutions? Well, from a, a mathematical viewpoint to begin with, the way in which we try to understand uh, how this could be solved was by looking at various case studies and seeing if our mathematics replicated it. So one of the case studies we looked at was the um, super spreader incident that I showed you, and we made predictions on whether the people that got the virus would actually get the virus in our mathematical model. And then we looked at a series of other situations. We looked at a a court case and we looked at a hospital setting as well where we had some data on concentrations and whether these people got the virus or not and I think from a reporting perspective that's what you want to use as well you want to say here is a mathematical model and it works in these contexts so we have some trust in the mathematical model here and then that gives you some indication of uh, how reliable this is. But again, it comes down to Alexandria's comment a while ago about probabilities and things. And what does it mean for something to be a good model or not? Does it mean that it'll get it right all the time? And, and that can be quite uh, subtle trying to communicate that. Thank you so much. So uh, we still have a number of questions. Uh, let's take the one from Francis. Uh, what more can journalists do if they have to communicate or transmit results from a mathematical journal uh, for the understanding of the greater public without distorting the essence of that particular scientific information? Alexandra. Hmm. I mean, I, I would contact the people who wrote the article and, and, and introduce yourself. And I think that they would be very excited to chat with you. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I would do. Absolutely. Um, Ian, any thoughts? I would say exactly the same. You can get so much from chatting with the author that you simply don't get from the article. And that might be a good explanation of the work. It also might be the backstory of what things they tried and why they didn't work and why they came to these conclusions. And so that would always be the best thing. And as Alexandria says, usually when we are contacted, that's quite an honor and we're very happy to talk about our work. Yes, I think I also have to add my home to it. You're yeah, absolutely correct. I I used to initially, I used to 
be concerned uh, that um, I'm, I'm not sure this uh, scientist would have the time. But a really interesting experience I've had is that sometimes when you have four journal, four scientists on a single paper, uh, the best is to just send an email, try and get the contact of everybody, copy everyone, tell them you are trying to write about their work and they're usually really, really excited about it. And uh, once in a while, you can be lucky to actually have a conference Zoom call with uh, with these scientists. And it's really, really beautiful. If you have a chance to talk to some of them on the same call, you are going to start appreciating the different insights that the different scientists uh, are contributing to the, to the work. And uh, you don't really have to be you don't have to be uh, a comp on to be able to understand the complex concept. They are there to simplify their work. They should be able to tell you why it matters. I think you, by the time you ask why it matters, uh, what difference, what change that is it bringing, what impact are we expecting to have, what are the potential applications of this. By the time you ask those kinds of questions from a general from a general perspective, bringing your audience. Uh, the way your audience would like to relate to these issues and the focus of your publication. Uh, by the time you're having those kinds of conversations, you'll be having clearer ideas regarding the line of that research and you'll be able to also ask further questions. So please and please, I totally understand and agree with them regarding reaching out to the scientists. That is the only and reliable solution to understanding the research. So uh, Sherry would like to know, uh, what do you notice is the usual mistake or mistakes of many journalists when writing a math-based story? I think we've answered this question at the outset, but we can still revisit it because I believe this is really, really an important issue. So let's start with Alexandria this time. I think he and started the last time regarding uh, what is out there, their concerns regarding what journalists are doing in reporting math stories. Alexandria, what are your thoughts? Sure. So like I said, I work in mathematical biology. So it's a lot of building models to make predictions about how cells work or how different biological systems work. And I found that sometimes when people write that up in public science venues, they say that my model has solved the problem, right? Or this is how the cells behave. And this model shows that this is how the cells behave. And it's really just something that Ian said, right? Um, about like whether or not a model is good or bad. Most models, like all models, are simplifications of reality. And in some sense, they're wrong. And in some sense, they're right. And really, the goal of a good model is to push the field forward and, and make predictions. And so most of the time, the problem is not solved. It's not like there shall no longer be any more work on coronavirus, because Ian has presented a model of coronavirus, right? He's presented something that, that made an impact and has led to more questions. That will lead to more research, right? So I think that presenting work as solved and this being the way it is, um, I feel much more comfortable when articles end on the questions that the study raised and how that will push forward more future work. Yeah. And, uh, and I think there is a reason that that is done is because that kind of story sells. And, um, <laughs> and there were so many times when I read articles a bit like Alexandria says, maths cures cancer or something like that. And you think, wow, this is amazing. And you read it and you think, wow, it's all done. It's all solved. And it's only when I read articles that are much closer to my field that I think this is actually stretching the truth a little bit. And it's understandable why, because that story is so much better than just saying mathematics here is making an incremental advance in understanding how cancer spreads. But it's, it's a tricky balance to get right. Absolutely. It's a, it's a really, really tricky one. And hopefully we get to balance. But you have to understand journalists. Uh, you have to be able to, the goal is we are trying to tell our readers why this actually matters, why you have to, why you have to really, really talk about this. By the time we embellish all of your concerns, yeah. all of your limitations, all of your uh, 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 restrictions, uh, concerns, then um, the hype to actually tell that story will not be there again. So I think for me, uh, to a strategy I've always also been using in this regard is uh, to add uh, to add to work on 
researches like that uh, from the perspective of an issue based, for instance, um, not just trying to talk about this solution is the best thing since uh, since S T Z is equal to M C square formula, but to really talk about what does this uh, bring to the table? What is it adding to the bigger problem? By the time you focus on the bigger problem, then it's much easier for you to plug in the latest update. Not that you are presenting the latest update as the solution to the whole ecosystem. I hope journalists will uh, pick on that too. Do you agree with me, Alexander? I think you are nodding. So I think. <laughs> <laughs> now I think uh, we also have some questions. Oh my God, time is running out. Um, okay, Mina is is appreciating case studies that are presented are very useful to pick, to depict the info in our minds when applying them. The presentations were awesome as well. Thank you. While you were looking at these other questions, I'd like to put a question back to everybody else and ask them <laughs> how they think we as mathematicians should be communicating our work and helping. So. Maybe as you're answering the final questions here and asking them, people could drop that into the chat and I'd be interested, and I'm sure Alexandria would as well. What should so, we be doing? So there's a here and would like to know your suggestions on what how you think generally uh, they can better communicate their research. Uh, two, two words and um, make your uh, comment as sunset as possible. So let's go to this question. Uh, Hmm. Iman would like to know, uh, how does the journalist convey, oh, sorry, I have Hayani on the screen. How does the journalist convey his medical or preventive idea to a society that is ignorant of all matters, especially some poor countries that do not have the necessities of life and because we live on the same planet? So the issue is this, um, to an audience that is, I think is a journalist issue, it's not for the scientists, <laughs> it's not for the scientists, but I would like to take a crack at it, that you communicating solutions, innovations, latest development to an audience that is, that is not prioritizing, that is not interested in that kind of news. For me, I think the best way you can do that is, uh, every how there is an outlet for each audience. Uh, you have a better audience and you have the better understanding of what matters to your audience. So um, if we are talking about, uh, and I believe the world and the different sectors are highly interconnected. So it's really, really difficult these days for you to talk about issues that are isolated and restricted to one part of the world. But it's for you as a journalist, to bring the uniqueness of your audience into the conversation that you are having with the scientists. For instance, if I ask here and right now, um, how does that paper on COVID-19, uh, how is it relevant uh, to a society? What difference does, can it make to a society that is still lacking access to COVID vaccines and uh, available treatment tools are not accessible to them. So what change can that tool bring? In my mind, I'm talking about Nigeria where uh, the uh, other countries, but can you see that I fashion that uh, question? So Ian, uh, how does that, what is the relevance of that paper uh, in a, to a society that is still not having access to full vaccine? How can they, make use of that information and insight from that publication. Can you take a crack at that? I think that's probably where this work could do its best because we were asked to work on this very early on in the pandemic when vaccines weren't so readily available. And the question was, can we start reopening the indoor spaces or not? So in some sense, it works better in places that, that don't have access to the vaccine um, because uh, as the vaccine was rolled out these questions started to become less important people were more comfortable to go into indoor spaces if they'd been vaccinated so it is really important in developing countries and as you saw with my water work a lot of the things that i do are in, in partnership with developing countries trying to um, help uh, in places where perhaps developed countries wouldn't need that assistance. Well, 
Well, as you can see, it's something you can easily do. And that is what we just did. Uh, what uh, he and just told me is relevant to my audience, even though the paper, uh, even though the study was probably done in Oxford. So you can see you can actually localize. It's your job as a journalist to do that. Don't put that responsibility on the scientist. And I think the last question that we can take because time is running out is, let's say you have a story where you would normally interview a political scientist. For example, is it worth it to approach a mathematician to see if they would be able to offer a fresh perspective, even though they have not done research on that particular issue? Alexandria, so if I come to you now <laughs> on the political issue and say, what does Mars say regarding this issue? What would be your response? I think it depends on the mathematician and the mathematician's area, probably. I don't know if I would go, um, I wouldn't throw a dart in a math department and pick uh, anyone. But if you were looking at a political science question that involved uh, for example, data and, and choices behind that data, then it might make sense to contact a statistician or someone who's more involved in machine learning. If there is a mathematician who has had some experience with that application, I think that that would be the most valuable. And it's, it's certainly wonderful to be engaging different disciplines because they'll offer different things. Ian? Yeah, again, I think I would say the, the same thing, really. So, so sometimes the, a, math, a general mathematical input into something can be quite insightful, even if it isn't in their particular area. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think um, if you were here during the time we we're having this conversation, I think on the issue of politics, we had the second session was on uh, artificial intelligence. So if I would interview uh, a mathematician, I'll talk to somebody that is an expert in AI and algorithm, somebody that talks about how online conversations are shaping, how you can actually track online conversations, how they are shaping the global discussions on key political elements. And from that side, you actually be having a truly unique insight on what is happening, the kinds of data sets that these algorithms are being trained on, and the kinds of insights that these platforms, information they are getting about their users and how those are being used. So you can actually do that. It's just all about looking at what the conversation is, and like they rightly said, what the expertise and interests of the scientists or, or this mathematician uh, is all about. And I think we have some answers to your question, uh, Hien. Uh, Samuel, Samuel wrote, mathematicians can help journalists report better on their work by engaging them from the outset of the research, unlike just publish, publishing wholesome results deep into the work. I totally agree with this. Uh, we will tell you, okay, okay, take us through the process. What are you trying to do? And I think it's an interesting genre of, re of reporting and of course of engagement, taking the journalist through the journey. I think it promotes openness. It promotes uh, much more better communication. You are trying to answer a question. I'm trying to report to you answer that question. It offers something unique uh, to an audience, and I hope uh, you consider it. And um, Sherry wrote, mathematicians, if they don't have a public engagement, can extend their hand by feeding their studies of findings uh, to media organizations, which is actually directly reaching out, directly engaging with media, and very, very active, being very, very active on Twitter, responding to issues in the space. And of course, uh, for me as a journalist, one of the first places I go to if I'm looking for a mathematician is Twitter, the social media. Okay, who is actually responsive? Who is active? Who can we actively reach? Because sometimes the email address in your scientific publication may be your last institution, which you no longer have current affiliation with, but you've already moved places and your email and your, but your social media account is like your digital footprint that we can easily reach you. So I would also agree with that, uh, being active. And uh, so uh, Francis also responded, I think the best way for scientists to communicate their research findings is either engage the journalist to transmit the message in a more simple and understandable language, or simply simplify the way they report their scientific finding. Yes, and I think um, one of the things that I think is really, really important is I, in my, there was a time I was helping uh, some scientists uh, to train them on how to communicate their work. 
I think it's very, really important uh, for you not to board aside the journalists you are trying to tell your work to passionately, especially if that person doesn't have those kinds of communication skills uh, to really help you simplify your work. So it's really, really important. I always say that be able to simplify to a five-year-old what you are doing and why it matters and being able to find a way to connect it to an issue uh, that everybody's talking about to offer that kind of unique uh, perspective. Ronald said, uh, hi, Hien, I think you're already doing great with the examples you showed us in your presentation. Yeah, that's really good too. I think the best way is to consistently show the mathematical ideas that are useful to people in their everyday lives, as opposed to sticking to abstract ideas, even though they are quite abstract, finding ways to simplify them for the everyday person helps a lot. Thanks to you both, Ronald from Kampala, Uganda. We can go on and on, we can go on and on. Then there's a lot of this. I hope, Hian, are you seeing all those comments? Yes, I've been reading them through. I wondered whether actually afterwards there's a way of you downloading this so that I could read them more slowly. It doesn't matter if yes. you can, but I've, yes, I've, I've, I've tried to read them as we've uh, they've been coming up. And thank you to everyone who has responded. Really yes thing. okay okay i think i'm helping you to lift uh this time this is what we are trying to achieve and i think we just did that uh being able to go back and forth uh you learning from the scientists the scientists also hearing from you and i hope we've been able to really really achieve that we've already gone beyond the time so what i would like to ask right now is alexandra or i think alexandra started let's start with you and this time uh what are your last remarks what are your last thoughts and uh, your advice and uh, any last remarks that you'd like to share on this session? My last remarks are thank you for inviting me to this. I think it's been wonderful uh, for me to be able to share and for me to be able to learn from you as well. And I think communication like this is really important and I hope there's a lot more of it. Alexandra? Yeah, I'll just echo what Ian said. This was total fun. So thank you to Paul for giving us this opportunity and for everybody who participated and for all these responses in the webinar chat. I'm looking forward to reading through them later today. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ian and uh, Alexandra. I really, really appreciate uh, you accepting our invitation and being with us on this call. And to everybody on this call, thank you, thank you very much for going through this journey uh, with us. And I hope um, you've been able to actually gain uh, one or two things uh, from horse and I hope uh, you've been able to have a truly truly different perspective on mathematics because uh, like I found out and uh, you've probably realized with this series uh, mathematics uh, really really solutions to everyday problems uh, they are not working in isolation and um, they are expected uh, to actually help us to better understand it. And if as a journalist, uh, you are not uh, interrogating, uh, inter uh, engaging uh, with mathematicians, you may be robbing your audience of some very, very important information and insight uh, that uh, may actually go a long way in impacting uh, their day-to-day -day lives. And I really, really want to thank everybody uh, that uh, saw this session through. So in the chat box, I want you to confess how many sessions did you attend? Did you, who attended the entire four? Who attended three? Who attended the two? Who is just attending for the first time? Uh, so let me see your chat box. Uh, how many sessions did you attend in hall? Uh, did you attend everyone? Yeah. Oh, Ronald attended the entire four. This is, that is really, really impressive. Uh, who else? Uh, let's see. Uh, who, wow, 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 wow. This is really, really, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's really, really impressive uh, regarding uh, what we've been able to really, really accomplish in the last four weeks uh, from, uh, from just talking about reporting and talking about how we can, what we can, actually gain and how we can actually proceed and make better use of it. So for those that are just attending the first time and those that are just are getting aware of this series, uh, don't worry. If you go to YouTube, 
and you search for International Center for Journalists, go to ICFJZ2 page. You are going to see all the videos uh, carefully curated uh, on that page. And, um, and I hope uh, you are able to actually go ahead and apply all this information that you've part, that you've learned today into your daily reporting. I want to see a lot of mathematics reporting stories right now. I want you to uh, test the waters, uh, general issues, when others are reporting general issues, try and find the mathematician to talk to, to introduce the mathematical rudiment. Uh, when you are trying to report solutions, talk about uh, mathematical aspects on these issues so that you can actually have that uh, today uh, that uniqueness to your story and um also try as much as possible to like we said last week i, I gave uh, an ass assignment to some journalists and i think some did it for you to identify three mathematicians in your country uh, that are relevant to your daily story that you can start talking to and you can start reaching out to so that you can have insights on what uh you are doing and uh, so that you can also be aware of what is happening uh, in, in the space. So that is how far we can go today. And uh, um, I just want you to, um, as we've been doing day week in week out, uh, to let us know what you've actually gained uh, from this session and how you intend to apply them. So there is a form I'm putting in the chat box right now. And um, I wanted to just two questions. What did you learn today? How did you, how do you intend to apply them? So that is really, really important um, in your, in your, in your, in answering this question, in getting across to you. And uh, we also have um, an additional question today. Uh, which is your pitch. So which is uh, the pitch uh, for the story contest. If you want to enter the story contest, uh, you are going to send us a pitch. And um, so please and please uh, share this, uh, get it across to us as soon as possible. And the way we want this pitch to go is this, what do you want to write about? How do you want to approach it? And um, what lessons have you learned? And um, who are you trying to talk to? If you can also let us know where you want to get it published. Please make it as short as possible. Go straight to the point. Be convincing in your answers. Try as much as possible not to overwhelm yourself. I'm a journalist. I know the stress of trying to apply for story contest. And I promise you this it will not be one of those stressful processes. Just tell me your pitch and um, where you want to put it out, where you want to publish the story, how far you've gone, you want to talk to. And um, that is it. So on the form that I just shared, we have three questions. What did you learn today? How did you how do you plan to apply them and what is your pitch uh, for the story contest i think we should also add uh, your name email address and um, the country of residence so those are the questions that we have for you and um, we are going to analyze them and um, we'll revert to our short list of um of um that we believe would be in the best position to win this uh, story contest. I look forward to, I look forward to hearing a lot from you, uh, noting the stories you will write, and I expect them to be fantastic. On behalf of the International Center for Journalists, I want to say thank you very much for everybody that saw this series to the end. And um, so please and please. Uh, you need to fill that form uh, for us to be able to process the certificate if you want a certificate of attendance. So please fill that form. Uh, it's only those that are filling that form uh, that uh, will be able to uh, will be able to get uh, their certificate. And um, so please and please do not uh, if you did if you did not have. If you do not uh, fill that form, we are not owing you any certificate. So I'm imploring you to please and please do what you are supposed to do on time. And we are going to take it forward from there. And I think this is the good point uh, to call it a day on today's special edition. Many thanks for hearing on that wonderful um, 
keynote speech, keynote address that helps us to wrap it up today and help us make a better sense of this uh, intention, what we set out to achieve. Many thanks to Alexandra uh, for your commitment to simplifying mathematics. Thank you for the fabulous audience, for everybody that actively engaged with us. Uh, you did not make it this one way alone, but you connected with us and we actually learned a lot from you today. To learn more about this initiative, uh, please uh, check out the International Center for Journalists website on www.icfj.org. And there are lots of resources for your journalism work. And uh, please and please uh, do not hesitate to reach out to uh, the International Journalist Network's website on www.ignet.org. Somebody is still asking for the link to the form, and I'll just put the link to the form there again. And um, I hope you see the form, you feel the form, and um, yes, may the best pitch win. Uh, we have 500 US dollars uh, for just uh, one person to win, and I'm looking forward to reading this award-winning story and beyond the grant i hope this story sets you on the right path for mathematics journalism and don't forget i think it's also important some of the editors uh, that we brought on this series actually expressed their openness to accepting pitches from you so please and please if you want to start pitching to those journalists to those editors you have my blessing and permission and authorization and encouragement to go ahead uh, to start doing that. If you need anything from me, any kind of support, any kind of insight, please and please don't be shy to reach out and we are going to uh, pull it off. So this is the convenient place to call it a day. And I hope you've had a magnificent time. On behalf of everybody, I just want to say thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.